Hey calculus class, today we are going to learn about topic 34, the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1. So what is the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1? And abbreviated, you can sometimes see it as FTC1. So the theorem is, <clears throat> if f is continuous on some interval from a to b, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative of little f um, in terms of b minus the antiderivative in terms of a, where f is any antiderivative of little f, that is a function such that the derivative of big f equals little f. Just to keep in mind, your book calls this part two. I've decided to flip them because part, in my opinion, part one is a lot more important. You're going to see it a lot. All right. <clears throat> what does the fundamental theorem of calculus part one mean graphically? So we need the net change theorem. And this says that the integral of a rate of change is the net change. That is that when you take <clears throat> the antiderivative of a function, then the difference between the y values on the antiderivative is your net change. So <clears throat> if we go back to our example of x squared from 1 to 3, which we know is 8 and 2 thirds, and let's look at the graph of the antiderivative, which we now know is x cubed over 3. So if we were to graph these, so this curve right here, the blue curve, that is my x cubed over 3. Now, if I was to find the y values on this curve at each endpoint, so at 1 and at 3, right? so I would get 1 cubed over 3, which gives me 1 third, and then I would get 3 cubed over 3, which will give me 9. <clears throat> so if I take that difference, that's my net change. Okay? And what this also means is now if I was to graph the integral or the uh, derivative x squared, which is the green curve, okay, and I'm calculating the area underneath x squared from 1 to 3, that area represents the same value as the change of y on the original curve. So in other words, the area under the graph of the derivative is equal to the change in height, or change in y, on the graph of the original function from a to b. So here's notations for f of b minus f of a. So we typically will write it as such, but you'll also see it <clears throat> as the following. Um, the antiderivative evaluated from a to b. That's what all of these mean. I typically go with the first one. Okay? Once you find the antiderivative, you still have to evaluate it from A to B. So, <clears throat> all right. So now let's go ahead and look at an example. So we want to find the area underneath this curve from 0 to 3. So your first step is to find the antiderivative. You do not need the plus C because it will just cancel out. <clears throat> So I find the antiderivative, so I add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. So I get x cubed plus x squared over 2 minus 2x. Now I'm going, now notice my notation here is I still haven't done anything with the 0 and the 3. So I bring it along, and this symbol represents evaluate from 0 to 3. So now I'm going to substitute b and a into the antiderivative then subtract the value you get from the upper limit by the value of the lower limit. So I'm going to plug in 3 first for x minus the value I get when I plug in 0. When I simplify this, I will get 51 over 2, which is 25.5. Which is Your turn. All right, so I want you to pause the video and for the next few problems, I want to see if you can find the area underneath the curve by hand without your calculator. All right, let's see how you did. <clears throat> so you should have found the antiderivative, which is t cubed over 3 minus 2t. Plug in 5 
minus what you get when you plug in negative one. Simplify, and once you're done simplifying, you will get 30. All right, for number two, <clears throat> the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x, and we're evaluating from zero to the natural log of five. So I'm gonna put in the natural log of five where x is and zero. E to the natural log of five, well the e and natural log, they cancel each other, so I'm left with five. And then e to the zero is one, so I get four. All right, for number three, antiderivative is eight y cubed over three, and the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And I'm gonna go ahead and plug in pi and pi over two to get the following. <clears throat> now once I simplify, I know that cosine of pi is negative one. Can't really do a whole lot with the pi cubed, so I'm just gonna leave it alone. Same thing here, uh, pi over two, I have to distribute that power of three, so I get pi cubed over eight. And cosine of pi over two, that is zero. So I'm gonna continue simplifying. So the two, the two negatives here become plus one. Here the eights cancel and I'm left with uh, minus pi cubed over three. Since these have common denominator, I can go ahead and simplify seven pi cubed over three plus one. And it is okay to leave it as such. You could, if you wanted to, find a common denominator to get seven pi cubed plus three all over three. Or if you wanted to, you could type in your calculator and get a decimal. For number four, absolute value. Remember that when you see absolute value, you must rewrite it as a piecewise function first, off to the side. So I'm going to rewrite the absolute value of x minus 3 um, to the positive side. So this stuff inside will be positive when x is bigger than 3. And it will be negative when x, when, uh, x is less than 3. Now, you're going to use your integral properties to split this integral up into two pieces because we have our absolute value is split into two pieces and the breaking point is at three. Well, three is in our interval from zero to four. So that means I'm going to have my first integral from zero to three and I have the negative part of the piecewise for that one and I distributed the negative through. Then from three to four, I'm using the top piece, the positive piece, so now I have the integral from x minus three. So now I'm going to do each problem separately. So I'm gonna find the antiderivative of negative x plus three, and then I'm gonna find the antiderivative of x minus three. So I will get negative x squared over two plus three x, and I'm gonna evaluate that from zero to three, plus x squared over two minus three x, and I'm evaluating this piece from three to four. Now when I evaluate, I'm plugging in three into this piece to get negative nine over two plus nine. When I plug in zero, I just get minus zero. In this piece, I, when I plug in four, I'm gonna get four squared over two, which gives me 16 over two, minus three times four, which gives me 12, minus, when I plug in three, I get nine over two minus nine. Now I'm just gonna simplify. I can combine some like terms, distribute some negatives. Um, 16 over two I know is eight. And combine like terms to get five. All right, now let's try this one. The velocity function in meters per second is given for a particle moving along a line v of t is equal to t squared minus 2t minus 8, where t is between 1 and 6. For part a, I want you to find the displacement of the particle during the time period. Remember that the displacement is the distance traveled between the start and the finish. So that means our displacement is our net change. 
So that means my displacement is the antiderivative of the velocity function, which would give me the position function, from one to six. So I can set that up using my velocity function, t squared minus two t minus eight. Find the antiderivative, evaluate at six, and then evaluate at one, and subtract them. And once I'm done evaluating at six, and at one, combining like terms, I get negative 10 over three. This means that the particle moved about 3.3 repeating meters towards the left. Yes, I know it doesn't make sense for distance to be negative, but what, and in this case, distance isn't negative. That sign is telling you the direction in which it's moving. It moved towards the left. All right, <clears throat> now I do have a part B for this problem. So now find the distance traveled by the particle during the time period. So that means that you want to find the total distance traveled, and that is how far the particle traveled in the time period, which means you need to know when and if the particle turned around. So. Total distance actually represents the integral from one to six of the absolute value of V of T. So that means it will look like this. <clears throat> so when a particle turns around, we know that's when the velocity equals zero. So I'm gonna first find when the velocity equals zero. So I'm setting the velocity equal to zero. I can factor it and I get t equals four and t equals negative two. Well, I know that negative two, first of all, is not in my interval from one to six, and of course time can't be negative. So, so what that means is that the particle must be turning around at t equals four. So I need to set up intervals. I have an interval from one to four and four to six. Each interval, I'm gonna determine if the velocity is positive or negative. So if I pick a number between one to four and plug it into my velocity, I will get that the velocity is a negative value. And when I plug in a number between four and six, I will get that the velocity is positive. By doing this, I am proving to myself that yes, the particle is moving, is changing direction because not only does the velocity have to equal zero for a particle to change direction, the velocity has to change sign as well. So now I can set up my integral into two pieces. So the first interval is from one to four, and I know that my velocity is negative on that interval, plus the integral from four to six, where I know the velocity is positive. So for each one, well, first off, I'm gonna distribute the negative through in the first integral. Now I can go ahead and take the antiderivative of each piece. And in the first one, I'm going to evaluate from one to four. And the second one, I'm going to evaluate from four to six. And I didn't write all of that work out, but when you do that, when for the first piece, the negative velocity, you get 18. For the second piece, you get 44 over three. So that means that my total distance traveled is 98 over three. And that would be approximately 32.6 repeating meters. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning about the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. And it is a very important theorem, hence the name fundamental theorem of calculus. We will be practicing it a lot tomorrow and I will see you in class. Have a good night.